said, I wish, you know, I would have, I wish I would have heard that whenever I was younger or their age, right? Uh, then there was a, a few that, that said, uh, I wish I would have treated it more importantly whenever I was young and growing up. But, you know, all of that is saying this right here. We wish we could go back with this new understanding, this new appreciation of sowing and reaping. You know, we might say something, if I could just do some of the little things differently uh, back then, my life would be a little bit more different now. Or we might think, uh, you know, I never would have done that first small thing to begin with if only I had, you know. Uh, but, you know, church, I think the truth is this. We knew, didn't we? We knew about reaping and sowing when we were younger. I mean, somebody told us in some way, Honestly, if you're honest with yourself, right? A grandparent, a parent, an uncle, a teacher, a coach, a youth pastor, a pastor. They, they gave us some version of it. Maybe not completely the way we're looking at it today, but, but we knew. We knew, didn't we? How, how we treat others is maybe how they're going to treat us, you know. Uh, if we uh, uh, do this, we're going to maybe, you know, get that. Maybe we thought we were exceptions to that law, or maybe we thought it didn't apply to us, or maybe we thought that we could do it differently, or it didn't really matter at the time. But without regard to any of that, we we knew. Personally, I, I I thought, you know, and I think this still today. I think that we thought then, just like the younger people may think today, well, we thought then, you know, I have time, right? Uh, we thought, you know, it, it makes sense what I hear you, you're saying, you know, I, I need to be careful with my decisions and, and I need to be careful with my habits because I read what I sow. I get that. I understand. But, uh, but, but I have time to get to that later, right? Uh, eventually, I'm going to start planting, right, some of the seeds uh, that you're talking about. But... Right now in my life, I'm just not going to worry about that. See, the problem with this thinking, church, is this. While we are waiting to sow the right seeds, while we are putting off sowing those God seeds, we are sowing all of these other seeds, you know, in, in its place. And before you know it, right, um, we are uh, looking back. So Paul warns us in Scripture but it also comes as a promise, too, right, that this is how it works. The seeds, the very little bitty small things, those things matter. And by small things, remember we defined it a couple of weeks, a weeks ago, we mean those things that are easy to do, right? But remember, if it's easy to do, what is it? It's easy not to do also, right? If it's easy to do, it's easy not to do also. Remember we talked about it's easy to do to save a few bucks to order water instead of a soda. That's easy to do, right? That's easy enough to do. Just save a few dollars during that day. But you know what? If it's easy to do, guess what? It's also easy not to order a, a water and get a Coke instead. Or, or wake up 15 minutes earlier in the morning uh, to uh, read God's scripture or to pray. That's easy to do. It's just 15 minutes, right? You, you know what's easier to do? The snooze button. Amen? The snooze button, that's, that's a little easier to do. I like what C.S. Lewis says about this. He says this in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, good and evil both increase at compound interest. That is why the little decisions you and I make every day are of such infinite importance. The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months later... You may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. And apparently, though trivial, indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or railway, railway line or bridgehead from which the enemy may launch an attack otherwise impossible. So in a nutshell, right here, uh, we have the law of sowing and reaping, right? And because it's always at play, those little decisions that give an effect of that, the real question becomes for us then, is it working for me or is it working against me? Am I fighting against it or am I leveraging it? You know, the moment that you jump out of an airplane, <laughs> right? Anybody jump out of an airplane recently? Yeah. The moment, let's go raise the hand, I'm going to The moment that you jump out of an airplane, 
The moment you leave that plane, gravity is not your friend. Amen? <laughs> gravity is working against you. Gravity is not on your side. It is not for you. But the moment you open your parachute, guess what? That same law of gravity that was working against you is now working for you, right? With the parachute, you are now leveraging gravity, which allows you to slowly and hopefully safely, right, arrive back on the ground to the Mother Earth. So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at uh, what Paul was telling us in more the context of the warning like we talked about. But today, there's a bit more hope in this message and what he's saying in Galatians. So look at Galatians 6, 9, which Kyle read in the most excellent manner. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Some of you really need to hear this this morning. I just want to stop for a second and tell you, you are in the right place today. Let us not become tired. Let us not become weary in what God has called us to do. I know right now some of you feel weary. I know right now you've been putting in the time and you've been putting in the effort and you're just not seeing much fruit from all the planting and you're starting to feel like, what's the point? I just want to encourage you, don't give up. Please, don't grow weary uh, in what God has called you to do. Just keep doing it because if you do, in time, or as the New Living Translation says, at the right time, you're going to reap a harvest if you don't give up. Some of you really need to hear this because you've been working at some things like some friendships or a marriage or a relationship with your kids, your finances, your health, your spiritual life. You've been making these huge efforts, but it just seems to be going just so slow. And you're really not looking like it's making much of a difference anyway. So Paul comes right alongside you this morning and says, don't give up. Don't go weary. Keep planting. Keep planting. Keep planting those seeds because you will harvest what you plant. There's an Old Testament story that's a great example of this biblical principle that we find in Galatians. And it's the story of Nehemiah. Anybody, this is not a very common story. Let me give you some background. Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the king Artaxerxes. He's the king of Persia, okay? Now, being a cupbearer is a slave position, just so you know where Nehemiah was and how he ranked in, in serving the country of Persia. 140 years earlier, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. See what I'm, y'all remember what I'm talking about, right? Then Persia came in, and then they took over what the Babylonians had conquered. And so now we find Nehemiah, 140 years later, as the cupbearer to the king of Persia. Persia. As the cupbearer, Nehemiah begins to uh, hear just how bad things are in Jerusalem. He's getting word about how horrible it is then, which, by the way, it's not clear, but it almost sounds as if uh, he had never been there in his lifetime. So look at Nehemiah 1.4. This is what it said. When I heard these things, this is Nehemiah talking, I sat down and I wept. Nehemiah sits down, and when he starts soaking all of this information in and starts realizing what's happening, looking at the situation, his heart breaks for Jerusalem. Now, church, he didn't plant those seeds, did he? He wasn't there 140 years ago. Those seeds of destruction that were planted were planted before his time, but, man, he sure is reaping it now, isn't he? He literally is living with the harvest from the seeds that someone else planted. A lot of us get that, don't we? Maybe we see some of this brokenness in our lives today of some of what we are harvesting. But we didn't plant it. Maybe it was a parent or a grandparent or an uncle or a certain situation out there that was beyond our control. But it wasn't what we planted. 
Nonetheless, though, things are broken now. And you know what our tendency is to do in situations like that? Our tendency is to focus on what they did to us, on how they left things for us, on the seeds that they planted that we are eating the fruit off of for us. But look, in Nehemiah, he quickly moves from that to responsibility. Instead of just, you know, mourning the ways that things are, he looked and said he mourned and he, he wept, you know. Instead of just complaining or, or being sad in the mouth about what's going on, he quickly moves the scripture to how can I change this? What seeds can I sow that my children will know a different Jerusalem than the one that I've known my entire life. Parents, ringing a bell here. Amen? Don't you feel that way about your kids? So here's what he does next. Look what he says he does next. I mourned and fasted and what? What? Pray. What do you say? Pray. When we don't know what to do and we're not even sure how to change something, guess where is always a good place to start? Prayer. Amen. This is a praying church. I mean, we're going to try and not <laughs> we're going to try and not do anything unless we pray about it first. We're going to try and not implement a program or put in a change or try to do a block party, right? Dude, that block party's already started in prayer. Amen. We are already praying for people that we don't even know that are going to come and that we're going to meet. It's already started. You don't know what to do. That's a great place to start his prayer. He didn't know what to do. He's a cupbearer. So he prays. God works in some incredible ways. And Nehemiah ends up going to Jerusalem to lead this effort of rebuilding the wall around the city. So if we looked in the book of Nehemiah, in the early chapters of that book, it's going well. One brick at a time, right? One day at a time. The sum of all of that starts to take shape. And then there's lots of optimism and encouragement and positive going on. But it doesn't take long for the opposition and the obstacles to arrive. See, guys, I think that that's one of the things that causes us to grow weary is we don't expect that. We don't expect the opposition. We don't expect the obstacles. We think... You know, we're going to start doing some great things for God, the things that God wants me to do. And because I'm doing what God wants me to do, He's going to make sure that everything goes smoothly. Some of y'all are shaking your head, you know. Not your first rodeo, is it? <laughs> In the farmer world, you know, I planted what God told me to plant. So guess what? The weather's going to cooperate, right? No. Seeds are going to grow how they're supposed to, right? No. There's not going to be weeds in my field, right? No. So when obstacles and op op opposition comes, we get really get discouraged. We get really worn out because we're not prepared. We're not thinking that that's going to happen. And for Nehemiah, and just as likely for us, that op opposition, you can't say that word, that opposition usually comes in the form of discouraging, kind of negative, run-of-the-mill old people, right? And guess what? These aren't the people that are in your outer circle, are they? Sometimes they're the ones that are closest to you. Nehemiah had two guys like this in his life, Sanballat and Tobiah. I like those names. These guys were haters. Man, they were just flat-out haters. And they, they hated on Nehemiah. And they hated on the builders, and they hated on the project. And, and all the time, they were constantly criticizing and ridiculing what they were doing. Look at 4, 2, and 3. This is uh, uh, a sad ballot at the first talking. What are those feeble Jews doing? Not just Jews, but feeble Jews, right? Were they restoring the wall? Now he's making fun of them. Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble? Sarcasm, right? Cynicism. Uh, divide uh, jumps in. He says even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stone, you know. Uh, these two guys, they see Nehemiah. They see the builders working hard. But the wall is so far gone, church, and it's so broken. 
that they start mocking them and making fun of them. Maybe you have someone like that in your life right now. They keep not only reminding you about how bad things are, but they keep reminding you you're the reason, <laughs> right? You, because you did this. That's why things are so bad. The sad thing is, is that, you know, you were like me, you probably thought they would really be there for you. But they weren't. I had a friend in Dallas who wasn't there for his kids when they were growing up. He's a corporate guy like me, worked a lot of hours, did a lot of bad things, you know, in his relationship with his wife. And so his kids grew up into adults, and guess what? At the same time, he became a Christian. He, he accepted Christ. And one of the very first things that God put on his list, on his heart to do, was to repair this relationship with his grown adult children. So he starts sowing that seed, right? He starts reaching out to them. He, you know, all the birthdays that he missed, he's not missing them anymore. Even now grandkids, boy, he's hitting those too. He's making the phone calls. He's sending, uh, you know, all of the uh, letters and and you know what response he's getting back from his kids? Really? Now are you going to step up and do something about it? Now, now are you going to try and be my daddy? I needed the daddy back then. I don't need a daddy now. You know what my friend wants to do, right? Just to quit. He, he, he's like, what's the point? I've tried, I've, I've, I've really tried really hard, and they're not receptive to it. For some of us, maybe we've decided, you know, to do some things differently, say in a relationship or, or in our own spiritual life, right? But all we're getting back is opposition, and we're getting back eye-rolling, and we're getting back comments like, oh, really? You're going to try that one again now? Well, it didn't work out too, too, too well last time you tried it, you know? I don't know why it would be any different now. Just like my friend, we feel like giving up. Or, or maybe you shared some change with a trusted friend. But immediately, what they're giving back to you is something that's unsupportive or condescending. Ha! You can never do that. Oh, really? Okay, let me know how that goes, right? Here's the deal, guys. We need each other, amen? Look around you in this room right now. We need each other. We need each other because uh, when we try to do this on our own, we get really tired really quickly. Remember the old quote, if you want to go fast, what? Go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. That's really true. See, our tendency is to hit it hard out of the gate and do it by ourselves and we grow weary instead. We need each other. We need to encourage one another. We need to go find some people that are trying to plant some new seeds in their life right now, make some new changes for God. We need to go out and we need to search and we need to find those people. And instead of being cynical and instead of being critical to them, we need to come alongside them and encourage them. Amen? That, I mean, we need to go find these folks. The Hebrew writer says it well in chapter 10. He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. I like the usage of the word spur here because in the Greek, what that means is to urge on. But you know what else it means? It means to stir up. Let's think about that, how we can do that. We know how to put people down, right? We're good at criticizing. We're good at making fun of folks. Let's learn how to encourage people trying to make these good changes and doing the next right things in their life and build them up. I just, I, you know, I just think uh, if, we, if we think about how we can help someone do the things they're really trying to do right, how we can encourage them really trying to obey God, how we can keep that stirred up inside of them and urge them down that good path that they've started on, we will have better days. Nehemiah had this opposition, and then in chapter 4 we see that he reaches the halfway point on the wall, right? Everybody, celebration. We're halfway done. Not so much for them. This ends up being kind of a hard place for them. You know why? Because it's like all of my DIY projects. All my do it your DIY projects. My do it yourself. Do it. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> DIY, right? 
You know why they're halfway done? Because I celebrate. Woo! Bathroom's halfway done. Look how much is left to go. <laughs> right? I'm tired. And they did the same thing. They started looking at it's halfway done. But if we look at the first 10, look at what starts happening, you know? It starts saying that the strength is given out. There's so much rubble. We can't do it. We've got so much left to do, you know? And then maybe they're saying like 140 years it's been this way. Surely if it could have changed, someone would have changed it by now. What's the point? And we think that's funny, but look, we do the same thing, right? You know what? I tried. I really did. I made an effort and nothing seemed to work. I don't see anything coming from the seeds I planted. Too much damage has been done. It's gone too far. There's too much rubble. My friend is too bitter. My debt is too deep. My relationship is too broken. My addiction is too strong. I'm too old. It's gone on for too long. Nothing can change it now. This is the harvest that I am going to have to live with for the rest of my life. What's the point? It doesn't matter Anyway, and once that mindset grows in, we're weary and we give up. Working out is an obvious example of that, right? We just get inspired to work out. Guess what? We don't try to make a couple of little changes. We go full war, right? I'm going to work out two hours a day, five days a week, right? And I'm going from not working out at all to that. And then about three days in, we're sore, we're cranky, we're being mean to people. Right? We can't move. We're hurting. We're depressed. We look in the mirror. We don't see any changes. And guess what we do? That we give up. Amen. Some are like, I wonder why it took you three days. Right? Okay. You know? <laughs> Dieting is the same way. We decide to lose weight. But we don't make little changes, do we? You know, we don't cut out just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We say, I'm not going to eat anything that tastes good. <laughs> Ever again. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to add on to that. Everything that tastes bad, that's what I need, right? <laughs> a couple of days goes in. We're being mean. We're angry. We have a headache. We're judging skinny people, right? <laughs> we have this insatiable craving that we are willing to give our children and grandchildren for, right? <laughs> we look in the mirror. Nothing's changed. And we give up. But right before we give up, we cry. Right? We cry, and then we give up. In relationships, we do the same thing. We decide we're going to maybe do some things differently around the house, like stop sowing seeds of negativity. Instead, we're going to sow seeds of encouragement, or we're going to stop sowing seeds of neglect. Instead, we're going to sow seeds of thoughtfulness, or we're going to stop sowing seeds of bitterness. Instead, we're going to start sowing seeds of kindness. We do that for a few days, and we're like, man, this is great. She doesn't notice. You know, it's just been a few days. She doesn't notice. And then we think we've been making such a huge effort. They're not noticing. We're not going to see, we're not seeing the results that we're hoping for. So we think, what's the point? It doesn't matter. Anyway. Have you ever heard the story of the Chinese bamboo tree? Misty doesn't like this story. Because I've been talking about the Chinese bamboo tree for two weeks. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Every time we see like a life lesson, I pause and I'm like, honey, that's exactly like the Chinese bamboo tree. You know, which she really enjoys when I pause uh, stuff on Netflix. Like, this is what this is really like, girl. Yeah. Here's the deal with the Chinese bamboo tree. It comes from a single seed. This is pictures of them right here, right? Uh, gets planted, watered, cultivated, fertilizer. And look how big those things are, man. But at the end of the first year, if you were doing this, you would look at a field, and guess what? Nothing after you planted it for a year. After the second year, you keep watering, fertilizing, and cultivating, and guess what? You go and check that field again, guess what you're going to see? Nothing. Third year, fourth year, guess what you're going to see? You're going to see a bunch of dirt, man. Nothing. But the fifth year, after five long years, you're going to finally see growth. I was thinking about this. Can you imagine what it would be like to be the first ever Chinese bamboo tree farmer? <laughs> I mean, I just thought it was something like this. The guy's in town. He's, he's having a hard time making ends meet. And so he, he meets a seed salesman. The seed salesman tells him, look, I don't see any Chinese bamboo trees around here. <laughs> Dude, if you plant these seeds, You'll corner the market on the Chinese Chinese bamboo tree. That's hard. It's the Chinese bamboo tree market, and you'll make tons of money. So the salesman said, "Now look, it takes a little time, but 
you're going to be rich. So the Chinese bamboo tree farmer now, right, grabs the seed, purchases them, rushes home to his wife. Guess that what she is like? Pretty skeptical, right? He plants them. He goes out and looks at six months. You know, there's nothing there. You know, his wife looks and said, huh, you know what? To me, it looks like the same dirt, you know, right? A year passes, nothing. The wife asks him, baby, are you sure you planted the seeds? Are you sure you put them in the ground? Because remember last year you forgot our anniversary, right? And so maybe you forgot to plant the seeds the second year, third year passed. The wife asked, did you plant them right? Maybe you planted them upside down and they're growing into the ground. Or maybe the seed was a little sideways and they're growing sideways on the ground. Fourth year passes, wife's had it, she's done, right? Chinese bamboo tree farmer comes in from a hard day in the field and she says, so, how'd it go today? At our imaginary Chinese bamboo tree farm. <laughs> Did you have a good day at work? You know what, honey? You've been working so hard, I'm going to make you the best imaginary dinner you can imagine. <laughs> and you know what, baby? Go ahead and set those clothes up because I'm going to do some imaginary laundry for you later. And at this point, the farmer probably wants to give up, right? He's been working hard. But he feels like he has to keep going because he's put so much time and investment in it. In fact, he can't stop because the water, the cultivating, and the fertilizing, he's done it for so long. Guess what it's become? It's become a habit now for him. But after five years, within six weeks, that goes from nothing to 90 feet. Amen. Wow. Can you imagine what the farmer told his wife? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some of you are in that five-year season right now. It's taking so much longer than you ever thought. You thought, you know, I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to do something differently. And by this time next week, it's going to be, that was two years ago. Paul comes alongside you in Galatians. And he says, I know you're tired. But don't give up. He says, I know it's hard, but don't grow weary. In Nehemiah, every time he felt discouraged, Nehemiah, in that book, 12 times he felt discouraged. Guess what he did 12 times? He prayed. 12 times. Every time he felt discouraged. And we, we run past that, you know. We're thinking that the work is in the field, but let me tell you what the word, real work is. It's in prayer before we get to the field. It prepares the ground. It cultivates every seed that the Spirit is planted in. If you're trying to plant seeds on your own strength and your own power, it's not going to work. When Jesus, right before he died, he was really drawn in close with his disciples, right? And, and, and so now he's getting down to just the stuff that really, really matters. And he, he's, not, he's not speaking it in parables anymore. He's like, listen, I've only got a few minutes left with you. So here's what I want you to know. You know, one thing he told them, he said, I want, I want you to know um, that uh, I, I, I am the vine, you know, uh, and you are the and you are the branches, you know. And he said, now, I, I, when I say that to you, uh, he's saying that uh, um, I, I want to just really tell you that uh, um, the reason, I've lost my notes here, guys. I just want to tell you that the reason why I say that, where is it? Sit. Okay. The reason why I'm telling you that is that um, uh, as a branch, you have one job. As a branch, you only have one thing that you have to do. And they stay connected. That's it. Everything else works out from there. And the one thing that helps us stay connected to the vine is prayer. Nehemiah Nehemiah would pray his way through this. In Nehemiah chapter 4, this is what he tells his people when they feel discouraged. Uh, He's like, one brick at a time may not look like it, may not feel like it, but that wall is getting built. Uh, He says, God is fighting for you. Don't grow weary. You're not alone in this. God is fighting for you. So Nehemiah and the builders, guess what? They just keep building. They refuse to stop one brick at a time, one day at a time. Even though it was broken, even though it was such a mess, even though it was not even their mess, it was left to them as a mess. didn't matter. Even though they may have felt like they weren't making a difference, they just kept going. I want to tell you, in our world, when those people won't take your phone call, right, or when they roll their eyes, or when they don't believe you, when you proclaim a change, 
keep praying. One day at a time, one brick at a time, one seed at a time. At some point, we're going to reap a harvest, guys. I'm closing up here. 140 years, man, that wall had existed in ruins before Nehemiah decided to do something about it. When you read the book of Nehemiah, you'd think, man, it took like uh, 50 years to fix it. But look at 615. You know how long it took? 52 days. 52 days. 140 years of people saying, what a mess. 140 years of people saying, we can't do anything about it. 140 years of people saying that it's too late. That wall was rebuilt in 52 days. So here's the challenge for us. The 52-day challenge. I want you to do it with me. All right? Uh, you're going to plant some seeds over the next 52 days. You're going to do some things that are easy to do, which also means what? They're easy not to do, right? These are things that you know God has been wanting you to do for a long time, but you've been putting them off. You, you haven't done it. So right now, I want to ask you, right here, right now, identify some things, some seeds that you need to stop planting, and then identify some things, some seeds that you need to start planting. Now, <laughs> you don't need to go home and pray about this. You already know, right? I mean, come on, really? Let me, talk, let me think about it for, no, you've been thinking about it, I just think for a long time. You don't need until Monday on this, you know, to know what these things are. Maybe for you, the next 52 days, you're going to stop using your credit card, you're going to stop raising your voice in anger, you're going to stop cursing. Maybe for the next 52 days, you're only going to listen to praise music, or you're going to spend 15 more minutes in the Word of God. Maybe you're going to pray on your knees when you wake up and when you go to bed each day for the next 52 days. Maybe you're not going to watch a certain type of show. Maybe you're going to walk away from this set of friends towards this set of friends each day for those 52 days. Maybe you're going to start tithing each Sunday during those 52 days. Maybe you're going to prayer walk a mile every day for the next 52 days, right? Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe you're going to write down three things every night before you go to bed that you're grateful for for the next 52 days, you know? I don't know what it is for you, but I know that some of us have been, some of us have been putting it off. So whatever it is for you, I want to challenge you to start doing it today. Now, some of you here are going to say, God, that's cool. I'm going to do all those things, right? Don't do that. Okay? <laughs> I, just, I just want you to do one thing. Just one thing. I want you to be a lot dot with me. You know what a lot dot is? Lot, learn one thing, dot, do one thing. I want you to be a lot dot for me. You know, uh, Misty's got a special printer that cuts these circles. <laughs> You know, so she made little dots, right? I want you to put these on your refrigerator, all right? It's about the 52-day challenge. Uh, Jeannie made this for us as an insert in our bulletin. It has a place where you can sign. I just want to, I just want to get you, the ushers are going to pass the plate around the last song right here. I want you to sign. You don't have to tell me what it is. I'm not going to ask you. Over 52 days, I promise you.